And in the last, in the last uh, two weeks, when posters have gone up, we've, as I say, Banksy's been active, and uh, we've had some scrawling. And um, the first one said this. Uh, it's a Christian country, this one was. Oh, no, it's not. Uh, read all the Bible and learn the truth about a vindictive God. That was the first one. And then this week's, read Exodus 21 and Deuteronomy. Not spelled correctly, but doesn't really matter. Deuteronomy. There's a Y missing as well. Now, if there's somebody hurting and upset and whatever, then I'm troubled by that. And that's a person we should pray for, at least. And, and be willing to, to encourage and help, if there's any way we can, to see things in context. Um, but what, is, what, what do we do with that? Um, there is this accusation that's been made. Richard Dawkins has been pretty much putting this about. He's written books and made a lot of money out of making this accusation against God. That our God is a vindictive God. That the God of the Bible is a vindictive sort of God. Richard Dawkins is a quote. God is a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniac. I, I just wish you wouldn't hold back. Yeah. So what do you do with that? That's the world we live in, and that's what's being fed into people's minds. Just in the last week, the uh, British National Secular Society, or whatever I think it is, or, or the Human Association, one of them, has sent packs into every school in the UK, um, which are packs encouraging atheism, of course, and trying to you know, encourage children to be atheists or humanists or whatever it is, uh, and not to believe. And this is coming from, I think, about 7% of the population uh, trying to influence the whole. They, they have a, a big hold on the media. Uh, they have a big hold in the chattering classes. And this is, this is the direction of travel. The objection that's being made so frequently then against the Bible is that the God of the Old Testament is a vindictive God because he takes strong action against sinful human beings. That is the accusation. And as I say, in this week's graffiti, we're urged to read Exodus 21, part of the covenant document, and Deuteronomy, presumably all of it. Um, I have, many times over, so have many of you. Uh, and, uh, well, Deuteronomy's long. <laughs> isn't it? You know. But it is pretty clear that God is saying there he is going to exercise his prerogative as designer and creator to write the manual on how his creation works and therefore how it should be used. And he also says he's going to hold accountable people who vandalize his creation by running it outside of that manual. Can't ignore that he's going to deal with these things. And the problem people have with his, his doing that usually revolves around two things in particular. The denial of his right to require responsible behavior within his creation. They don't want him to have the right to require responsible behavior with what he's made revolves around that and a failure to accept the significant sinfulness of sin. Now we don't back off either of those two points. God will require responsible behavior in his creation. We'll see some of the reasons why and why that makes sense even to people who don't believe. And secondly, we do believe that sin, sin is sinful and it's serious. So atheists accuse Christians of becoming used to the violence of God's judgment in the Old Testament. The word that they use is desensitized. You've read it so often, you're desensitized to the violence. As a Christian, I really hope not. It would be a terrible thing to be desensitized to that violence. God does act, and you could say violently, against the perpetrators of sin. He acts decisively, clearly and plainly with people who've gone so far, won't listen and come back from the damage they're doing in his world. God does act to judge sin, and that is real. The desensitization, desensitization and that's a difficult word, lies uncomfortably elsewhere. The trouble with sin, don't you find this, is that the longer you live with it and tell yourself it's okay to do that, because everybody else is doing it or whatever, the more desensitized you get to your own sinfulness and the pain and the grief that you cause other people. The less seriously you take it, and the more you want to accuse God then for acting against it. 
not just guilt-free sin that all, all human beings naturally long for, but free, sin free of consequences too. We want to be free of the guilt of it. We certainly want to be free of the consequence of it. And, and if God says he's going to do something about it, then our sinful human nature says that's vindictive. Now, if you want sin free of consequence, that is a longing that was born in the land of unreal. Because in this creation, sin will always bring consequences. Consequences for me and consequences for everyone else who shares my space. And that's just reality. Nobody sane argues that causing suffering is tolerable, do they? And sin leads to suffering. Sin leads to suffering. From the start, sin, I'm, I'm, I'm using that word as a biblical word, I'm using it as biblically defined, that stuff has caused suffering, ranging between mild and incalculable. Mild and almost unnoticeable, and cataclysmic and incalculable. And I've got to say, I guess you'd say too, wouldn't you? There are things that I've seen people do in the world, the world that God has made, after all, that make me cry out for God to do something about that. God, why don't you condemn that? But that's not my biggest problem. My biggest problem is I belong to those people who do the things that I long God would step in and judge. Oh, you know, perhaps not the scale, perhaps not the outlandishness, but there are at least things in me that are the beginning of all of that. And my heart cries out against those things. There's the difference, you see. The Christian is sensitive to the sinfulness of his own sin. But the atheist seems particularly sensitive to the theists. The Christian is conscious of his own sin and sensitive to that. But the atheist these days seems to be very conscious of the sins of the theist. And we've all got them. Sin leads to suffering in our world, whether directly in terms of cause and effect, or because suffering arises in the creation, and that sin generally brings creation into chaos. And sin so clearly leads down to death. I make such a fuss about things like cancer, we should. Heart problems, we should. Uh, give me another life-threatening condition. Uh, and we, we, we have charities and we have activity, and so we should, and that's great. But you know, the, the much more prevalent cause of death is sin. We see that in the life of the extremes. It's easy to see at the extremes, isn't it? We see that in the life of the addict. We see it in the life of the profligate. We see it in the life of the fornicator. Let's use that word. It's a good word to use. The fornicator. We see it in the life of the glutton. More and more. We're eating ourselves to death. I've had my healthy heart check this week. Can you tell? <laughs> it was all good. So, uh, <laughs> she had a sense of humour. It's fine. Um, <laughs> when mankind doesn't say no to himself... Or itself, how do you, mankind, his or herself, oh, I'm in a, see, I'm in a gender problem already. When we're in that situation and we don't say no to ourselves and live by our natural desires, the effect is ever so often a premature death. But Christian theology across both testaments and across history has recorded that it was sin that chaoticized creation and caused death in the first place. It is serious because it causes suffering and death. There's still more to say about it than that. Of course God's got to deal with it. We need to deal with the idea that sin is a private personal choice that's got no wider impact on creation and the people around us, the people in our space. That's not true. Listening to Radio 4 last night and there's a female comedian doing a thing at the end of a program I liked very much. No show. And at the end of this program, she was singing a little song about the ridiculousness of objecting to, to, to same-sex marriage. And, and the song was basically along the lines that the thing to do about same-sex marriage is if you don't like it, don't have one. That's quite, that's quite a funny song. It's quite a good song. But philosophically, horribly flawed. Because unless I'm going to have my... Same, I'm not going to have one. Unless I'm going to have a same-sex marriage in my little box and not touch anybody else's life at all, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Because it only affects me. And God who may be watching. But 
not true, is it? Because what I do in society affects everybody else in society with me. If I foul the nest, everybody else has got to sit, sit in the droppings. Sin is serious. And it does affect people around me. And it will have tangible results for me and for them. If I believe it's okay to speak the truth, careless of anyone's hurts, I'll leave a sea of devastation in my wake. My sins affect other people. And only if God is a nobody will my sin against him have no real effect on him. And only if he doesn't exist and nobody believes in him will my sin against him have zero effect in this creation. Sin affronts no one. Nonsense. And at the end of the day, you know, the truth we know, but we find hard to live with, so some deny it with all their being, is that rightly all sin should be dealt with. It should be judged. Sin deserves penalty. That's the way we actually live our lives. Because you can't actually live like an absolute relativist in the end. It doesn't work. You can't live like that. It doesn't work. You can only live with things that are wrong being dealt with. Sin should be judged. It's those who will not accept what their consciences would lead them to who then turn the equation on its head and accuse God of the injustice for judging the sins of the wicked. That's upside down. Sin's serious. Until our sins are allowed to callous our consciences, we know that. And with uncalloused consciences, we do not accuse God of doing wrong by dealing with decisively with sin you look at things in the Old Testament that are alleged against God you find he's being accused of rooting out inveterate grief causing sin sin that humans still seem determined to cling to so they cry foul and call him names when he does that and that's the problem we're dealing with the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament is a God who judges sin and well he should and that's not vindictive that's what needs to be done. Because the chaos in creation that results otherwise is, is, is ridiculous. And beyond that, not all justice is remediative or restorative or aimed at teaching people a better lesson. There's justice that comes because a penalty falls due. And because justice requires that it should. In the New Testament you see that very clearly. You see that because God shows the enormity of our sin and how God has to go to extreme lengths to pay the price of it by soaking up that penalty in himself above anything, everything else that shows that he is not a vindictive God because he puts his own life on the line to deal with the requirements of justice the people who are in the wrong should be free that's not the act of a vindictive God let's, let's just illustrate how the character of our God is not a vindictive God, and we'll do it with Mark 2, okay? Now we're going to go quickly through Mark 2.